Our first guest is a hugely popular stand-up comedian, actor, author and commentator on CBS Sunday Morning. It's always a joy to have him on the show and we need him now more than ever. Please welcome the incredible Mr Jim Gaffigan is on the show. Jim, it's so nice to see you. It's been a Great crazy day with everything going on. How are the Gaffigans holding up? Oh my gosh, it's, I, you know, I don't, you know, we, I guess we had these naive expectations that once 2021 would start, that it would just be all uh, just, you know, gravy and like, you know, contemplating what we're gonna do once the pandemic's over, but it is getting crazy and crazy. And today is just absurd. It's, it's a level of absurdity and like everyone, I was watching things happen over the, on the news, and and I was reading along on Twitter, and I and what I thought of was because here I am, kind of riding out the pandemic with my five children. I was thinking, how am I going to explain this to my kids, or how is history going to explain it? I mean, so many people were doing such amazing commentary stuff on Twitter. So I just decided to, I uh, I talked about it from a historical perspective, kind of like, like, you know, in my mind, we've all watched this slow build of this chaos, you know? And so what came to yeah. mind was this idea. And then the Trump supporters stormed the Capitol building and the Republicans still did nothing. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. just this weird thing. You know, when you think about, like, even when you did Maybe I'm Amazed, like, that was a lifetime ago, James. Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was a decade ago. It's... <laughs> right. The whole... But you're right. The, the, you're right, that thing, because I feel like there's been so many instances over the past, certainly 12 months, but actually four years, really, where I've had the feeling, or I've had the conversation with my wife, how do we explain this to the kids? Because they'll yeah, catch the news or they'll see something going on. And I think that's quite an interesting way to do it, really, to think about it as being in the past to, and then this happened, you know? Yeah. Which is how you explain terrible atrocities throughout history to, to yeah. children. That's quite an interesting way of thinking about it. Yeah. And so I did, um, I don't know if you want me to read these. It's funny because I was, you know, before this, I was at dinner with my kids and I ended up reading them to them because obviously we're all kind of going through this and whatever, um, however we digest this or the level of catharsis we can grasp onto is what we're holding on to. So it's, it's, uh, and then this, the Trump supporters stormed the Capitol and the Republican Party still did nothing. And then someone commented, then what happened, Daddy? This guy, Joe Reynolds, chief, then what happened? Uh, and so then I just kind of played off it. Then what happened, Daddy? Well, then traitorous, cowardly Republicans prayed that people would forget about their seditious behavior. Daddy, did they? Did people forget that Republicans caved to everything Trump wanted out of fear of facing a primary challenge? Uh, well, son, that is why we tell this story. So people know the Republican Party was rebranded. They had to be. Daddy, what is rebranded? It's when a, a product, or in this case, a political party, is so toxic that they must hide who they are. Wow, those Republicans were cowardly, Daddy. Yes, son, they were, and they still are. But they were also wildly ambitious. Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and Josh Hawley all knew better, but they were consumed with ambition. Ambition for what, Daddy? To be president? That's right, son. They wanted to take over the Republican Party when Trump went to jail, or they wanted to be to a big job on Fox News. Daddy, what was Fox News? Was that a network? Well, Fox News was a propaganda arm of the Republican Party filled with crazy men and mostly blonde women. Daddy, is that why people make dumb blonde jokes? Ha ha ha. Not all blondes are bad. I used to have blonde hair. 
you had hair when Trump was president? Well, a little. Um, and it goes on and on. And it's just, it's it was something that was cathartic to kind of digest this chaos because we all have known all these steps. It's so weird to witness this and see it happen and see these people that are supposed to keep him in check not do it out of what I believe is fear. And yeah. it's just, in the end, you have to have some principles. Well, what's strange is, I, I don't know about you, but it's kind of in the, in the sort of maybe month leading up to the election, it, I would I'd have, find myself having conversations with people and they'd say things like, it's gonna get really ugly. You watch, it's gonna get really ugly. There's gonna be, there's gonna be some real civil unrest. And then the election happened and obviously it, it took longer than perhaps some people thought it was going to. And by the Sunday when Biden was announced, you're sort of thinking, is it gonna, and it sort of didn't. And then yeah. now with the, you know, the runoff in Georgia, seeing what's happened today, part of me feels like sort of going, well, who could have predicted this? Oh, that's right, everyone. Like, yeah. we knew that it was, it was coming at, at, at some point that, would, that it, would, it would just sort of bubble up in that way, you know? Well, I think it's incredible because I'm not a politician. I used to do stand-up comedy. I'd like to return to it eventually one day. <laughs> I like to act. But the thing is, is the reason I'm not a politician is because I'm a coward. You know what I mean? The reason I respect the military is because of their bravery. And the, the politicians are supposed to stand up for the principles that they believe in. You know what I mean? They, they wanted to serve the greater good. And so I'm not saying that politicians are supposed to be perfect, but like at least do some of it. You know, it's like I understand that these people don't want to be primaried or they want to be able to go to their country club and not be harassed. But like, you gotta do your job. You gotta do your job. It's like all these people that are protesting, I don't necessarily blame them. I blame the, the, the inability of people just to stand up to what we know is a bully. And it's, it's weird as a parent and being trapped with my family for 10 months, it only heightens the responsibility. It's like our kids yeah. are watching. It's like, it's not as if history is not gonna reveal that, that Trump was wildly corrupt, that these Republicans, that, that whatever, that, that Mitch McConnell's speech was the right thing to do, that, that it was right for Romney to stand up and say what he said. It's like, history's gonna show this. So you're doing it so you can enjoy your appetizer at a country club? It's like, how short-sighted can you be? Anyway, that's why I'm running for senator. No, I'm not, <laughs> I don't wanna be a politician. It's, it's weird because I feel like you and I, not only are we, you know, we're, we're kind of like, you're a British version of me and I'm a, and you can you know, <laughs> talent and I don't, but, there is part of me that I feel there is a certain, I don't want to, you know, like, I, I like observing politics. I don't want to be involved. I, I'm a fan of democracy. I'm a fan of people that serve, the people that military, these political leaders that give their lives to serve their community. I have respect for that. But I don't want to do that. I want the news to be boring again. And it's yeah. it's almost as if, and I'm speaking for you, it's like we, we keep getting dragged into this and it's not kind of in my personality. It's strange. Not in any way. I mean, that, that's, that's how I feel all the time. I mean, look, we're doing this show in, a, in my garage because of an absolute lack of leadership and clear messaging. That's what it's, that's what it's down to, all of it. But you would think, you would think that, because it's interesting you saying that about the the Mitch McConnells, the Rubios, the Ted Cruz's, uh, you would think that they would look at, you know, someone like Stacey Abrams and what she's managed to do and the volume of respect that is coming her way and rightly so and should continue to do so for decades for what she's done for 
you know, on the ground, in ground roots politics, that you would think in a way that you would look at them, that they would look at them and go, oh, I should, I should be more like that. That's, yeah. I should have a, I should stand for something. Right? It's, it's, and it's, for me, it's just maddening because I don't believe that the 74 million people that voted for Trump, I don't think they wanted this. They didn't want no. people storming the Capitol, but they were presented with a, a decision and they chose what they thought was the lesser of two evils. I disagree completely, but it's just, it's just like, I, you know, it, it bothers me. It kind of like, he, he, during this pandemic, I've had to become this morning person where I have to wake everyone up. I don't want to do that, but that's my no. responsibility as a parent. And the fact that like, you know, I don't want to, you know, use my social media to kind of take these swipes at these cowards. I, you know, I want to do food jokes. I want to like, you know, I want to talk about being lazy. I want to romanticize the 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 dormancy of what i aspire to but if no one else is gonna do it you know what i mean i it's strange it's you know this whole pandemic has changed me completely i i am somebody who railed against vegetables and then during the pandemic i grew a garden i'm somebody who criticized and made fun of hiking but during the pandemic it's the most safe form of exercise outside you could do and yeah. you can do it with your kids. And, and you know, it's like I did like five minutes on winter activities and how ridiculous they are. I made fun of Canadians for having outdoor festivals. And I, you know, in early December, I bought a pair of cross-country skis because I'm no. a, essentially, I'm dismantling my whole act. Hang on. You, why would you buy cross-country skis? Because I've been... Uh, waiting out this pandemic with my family and to get outside and to have some kind of some time alone it's it's just something that is strange and there's something peaceful about it i've only done it twice but i did it as a teenager and despised it but like i don't know this is you know like if this pandemic goes on for another three months i'll probably be a vegetarian i don't know what's going to happen <laughs> But the cross-country skiing makes no sense to me because it feels like it's slower than walking. I feel like, because the skis downhill, I understand. Someone at one point went, well, we need to get down there fast. Well, if we yeah. slide down on these, it'll be faster. But cross-country yeah. skiing, it just seems to me to just be going. It's like, it's, it's like, exhausting. It's like, it's the elliptical. That's, it's the Nordic track, right? That's where cross country skiing yeah. is. And, but there is something kind of peaceful. And, you know, during the pandemic, I, uh, you know, I, I normally travel constantly. I'm normally going out to dinner after a show. That's my big reward and I'm eating 10,000 calories. And so I've been kind of healthy. And so, Cross-country skiing is a great form of exercise. I mean, of course, the snow all melted, uh, so it's, you know, we haven't had that much uh, opportunity for it, but it is a good form of, of exercise, too. But I'm losing my mind. I'm losing but my mind. But also, it gets you out of the house, because you, like I, you have, well, I have three children, you've got five children. How is that with the online schooling? How's that going in your house? Yeah, we're, we're, we're done with... Christmas break, and we're doing the, uh, distance learning because we wanted it to be as hard as possible. And also, <laughs> you know, my wife is high risk, and as she describes it, I'm a fat old guy, so I'm high risk. <laughs> too. And so, it is so absurd. Like when New Year's Eve was happening, there was I remembered back to previous New Year's Eves where it was like, are the kids gonna make it up to midnight? And my kids don't go to bed till like one in the morning. I'm talking about my eight year old. And this is me trying to get him to sleep because my oldest is 16 and my youngest is eight. So they all err on the oldest worst habit. So they're, they're total night people. And so now we're going back into distance learning. So it's like, get out of your bed, sit in a chair, 
and try and, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to ask any 15 year old to do, but I don't know. What are we going to do? You know, it's like, it's just Groundhog Day over and over again. The 15 year old, the parents of 15 year olds, 15 to sort of or like 14 to 17, 18 are the parents that, that I've felt most for in all this actually, because our kids are, you know, they're nine, six and three, which I think is, we're, we're, we're just okay. But like the, the notion of being 16 and being told you've just got to stay in the house with your parents. If I think back, I would do anything to get out the house. I would sit on a wall outside a shop with my friends doing nothing just to be somewhere else. How's that been? Has that been, has it been it's, okay? It, it's really, you know, it's, it's a sacrifice. I mean, we are all about, it's a balancing act because you didn't want them, you don't want them to spend, like prior to the pandemic, you didn't want them to spend all this time just online. But now that's yeah. how they socialize. That's and it. that's the yeah. safest way to socialize. And so there's some of that, but then there's also, and if they're getting the grades, how can you stop them? You know, you want them to have some mental stability. So my 15 year, my 16 year old, she's like a saint. She's perfect. My 15 year old son, he has the new PS5. So he should be good till like March, maybe. But then... <laughs> I don't know. It's it's amazing. It's amazing. Anyone, any relationship is surviving the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, when you'd hear about a couple breaking up, you'd be like, that's so sad. And now you hear about people breaking up and you're like, of course, of course, <laughs> they broke up. <laughs> They're dealing with a pandemic. What else would happen? No Do one wants managed... to spend that much time with anyone. But you managed to, you shot a movie during lockdown. You shot this film, Linoleum, which I'm really excited to see. It comes out later this year. What's it about? Like, who, who do you play in this movie? Um, it is, a, it was an amazing opportunity. It's, it's a really, uh, it, I, first of all, I got to work with Ray Seahorn, who's amazing. And there's a yeah. bunch of great actors in the film. But I play this guy who uh, is someone who always aspired to be an astronaut. And he uh, has a children's uh, science show. And he essentially uh, loses his job on this kid's science show to this guy who was an astronaut who looks exactly like him. And so I get to play both parts. And then that guy has, he actually has a uh, rocket land in his backyard. Our main character has a rock, so he decides to build his own rocket. It's a, absurd, but it was so fun to work, but it was weird because everyone had masks. I'm sure that, you know, there's these safety protocols that our yeah. unions are very kind of thorough with where there's every mm -hmm. couple of days you're tested, but none of the performers, uh, you know, when you were acting, you didn't have to wear a mask, but otherwise everyone was totally masked. So it was a little bit like, acting like the the entire it, would, it was like the entire crew was in a burqa so you didn't know if people were happy or sad with you it was it, it was incredibly efficient because everyone focused on their job there wasn't yes. even kind of you know it was strange it was i don't actually I'm, mind i don't yeah. mind the mask if i'm honest because i tell you why i like the mask you can stifle a yawn <laughs> you can just like that's my worst part of any days if I'm talking to someone and it's nothing to do with what they're saying. They could be being absolutely fascinating, but I find myself doing that sort of, sort of yawn. Yeah. Now, with the mask on, I'm freely yawning, but still listening. No one's offended. I actually don't, I don't mind it. What, are you okay yeah, with the I, mask? You know, my problem with masks are that I have a huge head that uh, <laughs> is not mask friendly. So right. it's... It's very similar. Like this is this is I I don't know what size this is. Like three XL, and this barely covers it. I usually most masks. My beard is down here, and it's always <laughs> kind of coming down. It's because when I was you know it, I played American football in middle school and high school, and in middle school they had to go to the high school to get me a helmet 
that fit wow. because my head was so big, uh, mm -hmm. metaphorically and actually. So uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it's just a glamorous experience with this huge head that, uh, you know, like even like knit caps, like when you get a, a, a wrap party, uh, they'll give you sometimes a knit cap. Mine doesn't yeah. fit. You know, or like the 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 beanie that sags in the back. Mine never sags because it barely can reach over. It's very sad. <laughs> well, it's it's a it's a beautiful head, and and we are so thrilled that it's here on the show. Stick around, everybody.